Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Courtney Ralston Deuce. I oversee external communications at INL. And again, thank you for coming um, to our Chernobyl panel. This is our second, our second week. Um, we did this a few weeks ago. It's been a little bit of an experiment and test for us as we've gone through the panels. Um, we haven't really done something like this so much in communications where we've had a panel and have more of an interactive discussion and this direct engagement with employees or uh, the community. We did two community events yesterday that went really well. So I'm gonna ask that on your seats there are feedback forms and those are really important to us. Um, because as we've gone through, uh, we've gotten better. One um, gentleman who attended our very first session kindly pointed out last night that we're way better now than we were <laughs> two weeks ago. So that's always good. I'm glad to say we're improving and we're taking feedback well. Um, so that's good. Um, we've also learned to talk into our microphones, uh, which is also really helpful. And Chris Morgan is recording and there's been a lot of interest by um, people actually all over who've wanted us to record and post these sessions online. So if you, we're, we want this to be very interactive, very Q&A focused. So as you have questions, Nicole has a microphone, we ask, and Lori has a microphone, we ask that you speak into that so we can capture it and everybody can hear the questions. Um, but before we get too much further, I would please go to, if you see this um, little URL at the top, pollev.com forward slash INLOD. Uh, this is a really important piece of this conversation and this discussion because it really helps guide the questions. Since we've, uh, we started working on this concept uh, for the panel a couple months ago after the Chernobyl miniseries aired, we were starting to get a lot of questions from uh, different people in the public, on social media, about the miniseries and what it got right, what it got wrong, which is not unexpected given we're the lead lab for nuclear energy research. Um, but a couple of things I've been pointing out is that this is actually the Chernobyl HBO series is a mini series. It's a dramatization, it's not a documentary. Um, we've had a lot of those questions as well. You'll hear from the panel today uh, what aspects they got, uh, the director got right, which ones were dramatized. Um, and you'll have an answer uh, through the app that the pollev.com, you'll be asked to vote on aspects or questions that we've been asked to help guide this discussion about what things you want to know about. But periodically, I'll be asking you if you have any questions as we're moving from slide to slide. You know, this again meant to be very interactive and not us talking at you, but talking with you and answering questions. Um, so as we go forward, um, I'll ask the panelists, I'll introduce them, ask them to say a few words. In the meantime, we'll start the voting. Uh, in addition to it being, we classify it as a mini-series, which I think is important to denote um, so people don't think that it was meant to be a documentary. Uh, the, other question, the other question we've gotten a lot is whether the director, who is also the writer, uh, is anti-nuclear. And there was a lot of early discussion about that when people heard the mini-series was coming out. And actually, if you read I read a bunch of articles, Roger listened to all the podcasts with the, the director. Um, he said he's not against nuclear energy, but he is against government secrecy. And if you've seen the, uh, the miniseries, and I'll ask that in a minute, that comes across pretty clear about the role of science, uh, the role of scientists, um, the state of Russia at the time, at the height of the Cold War. There's a lot of that sort of discussion and framing around what happened. And it played a pretty big role in the, the event, in post-event um, Russia disbanding. Um, so anyway, how many people have actually watched the miniseries? Not that you've had to, but it is helpful. And you know, if you're planning on watching it, um, there's maybe a spoiler alert a couple places. I don't think it will make it not a great series because it is very entertaining to watch. But you know, just be prepared. There could be a few spoiler alerts here. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, George Griffith at the end. Uh, George uh, works at INL. He interfaces with the nuclear industry to develop new projects such as the new scale small modular reactor, which is scheduled to be, be, be built here in Idaho. Previously, he was a reactor engineer and reactor engineering manager at Nebraska's Cooper Nuclear Station. His expertise includes core design and core operations which played a very big role in the, in the accident at Chernobyl. Um, Ron 
um, who has my favorite t-shirt on. He bought it in honor of the panel. It's $20 part. I spent for you. Yes. And I think he also did it to prove he's not boring, because I think Ron really strives hard to not live up to his name. Um, he's, and we always say that Ron's a pretty interesting guy, an expert on nuclear reactor risk analysis and safety systems. He is a human factor scientist, which means he studies how humans interact with machines, such as reactor control systems. Brad Schrader, um, I don't know if he'll talk about kilts today. He did last night. Uh, anyway, Brad Schrader is the radiation safety subject matter expert with INL's radiological control and emergency management department. His areas of expertise include atmospheric dispersion of radioactive particulate, reactor safety, socioeconomic socio impacts of environmental radioactivity and radiation effects. He supported transport and dose consequence modeling of the plumes from atmospheric testing, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Roger Madsen co-chaired the IAEA's post-Chernobyl development of safety principles for nuclear power plants. He has served on nuclear safety review boards for five U.S. nuclear power plants and worked with the NRC, the EPA, and other public and private institutions affiliated with nuclear energy. So we will go ahead and have them say a few words. George? Sure. As mentioned, used to work at a nuclear power plant, this sort of event, they actually have training specifically for it at the plants. And sort of the way, from the nuclear physics standpoint, nuclear engineering standpoint, you're looking at the neutron balance in the core. The more neutrons you have, the more fissions you get, the more power you make. Um, so that's what nuclear engineers do. They balance how much uranium and how the neutrons are going to be in the core and all the factors that um, can affect that. And in the Chernobyl event, there were some very specific uh, features to this reactor, where it was operated, what it was made out of, what its history was. Um, the lack of learning from the previous examples um, that led to this accident. And when you hear the time frame, it kind of rolls through uh, to a point you say, okay, here's where the accident started. But from the nuclear physics standpoint, they started this accident hours before they actually got there. Um, and then at some point, they were actually doomed without knowing it, I think. So we'll get into that. There's questions on that, questions about the actual physics and the causes. We can get into that as well. One that we run into a lot is why it's different with the U.S. reactors. Why hasn't this happened here? What doesn't happen here? And the INL plays a really vital role in that. Starting back in the 40s and the 50s with the borax reactor and the spurt reactor and the power burst facility reactor and TREAT and even uh, TREAT today. All these reactors were used to study these sort of effects. The borax reactor, for example, was the first boiling water reactor. So you make uh, heat in the fuel rods, it boils the water, the steam comes off, and eventually you use that to run a turbine in a commercial plant now. But early on, they weren't sure. If you made a lot of steam, um, the reactor would empty out of coolant, and then it would cool down, and then the steam would collapse, and maybe it would pulse and be unsafe. And so they tried that at INL, and you can see on the web uh, examples where they would pulse the power at uh, the uh, borax reactor. And like good engineers everywhere, they said, wow, if I worked with one, how about two and three and four? And they kept doing that until they found out where these reactors were unstable. And again, it's worth it because at the uh, borax reactor, they were pushing water and steam out the top of the building. Um, it's pretty spectacular. Um, and then the sequence of reactors after that, we as the United States and the Western countries spent a lot of money and made a lot of effort to make sure we understand what was making these reactors unsafe. And that's directly related to the um, choices made at Chernobyl that didn't address those factors. Um, so INL's had a big role in playing that. Um, lots of effects, again, that happened way before we think it happened. So I'm a psychologist, and so I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the safety culture aspects of this. And I think one of the most interesting things about this was the fact that they were actually doing experiments on the equivalent of a commercial reactor. That's not really something we do much of here. That's why we have test reactors. And we certainly don't shut off safety systems as part of that. So, so the whole culture that would lead you to be able to do something like that is something that isn't present in the US. Um, it, George alluded to the fact that we have so many different uh, uh, test reactors, test systems. I was just in Cairo, so one of the, the new small modular reactor vendors a few weeks ago, and their whole setup, their whole um, uh, site is, is configured with test loops and everything to ensure the safety of the system before it goes live. Um, 
Another thing that comes up is this lack of questioning attitude. And this this T-shirt, the 3.6 Renkin, um, not great, not terrible. Uh, that's actually a quote. And, and what, what happens in the movie, here's our spoiler, uh, what happens in the movie is um, that's actually the the the, the high uh, reading level for these um, dosimeters that they have. And so it was a much higher level, but it, the, this information got percolated around. That's as high as they could read. It was actually considerably higher. And it, the, the word just passed on. Oh, it was 3.6 Renkin. Oh, it's not terrible, not great. It could be a much worse accident, right? And that's, that kind of represents that lack of questioning attitude. They all had the knowledge that this was the upper limit on those dosimeters. Um, then we have the whole author authoritarian power relations, and this is against Soviet Union. Uh, I'm not a political scientist, so I won't uh, claim any great expertise in that, but I think one of the things that is um, accurately portrayed is this inability to stop work. I mean, that's so ingrained in everything we do here. If something's unsafe, stop work. And they weren't able to do that. They had to proceed. Um, another thing that comes up, uh, and I think you'll get some of this in Roger's timeline when he talks about it, um, is that the crew that actually performed the test was not the crew that was trained to perform the test. So there's this complete lack of training going on, and they really didn't know what to expect and what the parameters were. And when they ended up far outside of those parameters, uh, they didn't realize it. That's what we do. Our, our crews, uh, certainly our commercial crews in the US, they go into training every five to six weeks. Um, so they're on top of these things. Anytime we do something new, like a startup scenario or something like that, uh, we train the operators extensively for all the permutations that are there. Um, and then the final point, uh, since I do risk analysis, is there wasn't really a thorough risk analysis of everything that, that could go wrong in this. And that gets into uh, the reactor design. There were actually some, some there was some history of this uh, reactor design having problems, but that got buried. It didn't get passed on. We didn't have a lessons learned or a, a corrective action plan. So lots of interesting stuff going on from a psychological perspective, uh, but ask the hard questions from, from these guys. Spoiler alert, it blows up. <laughs> Sorry to ruin the end bit for you, but yeah, it did. It exploded. Um, as far as the radiation uh, effects side of it, there are really multiple prongs where we can discuss today. And it's really up to you. The first thing that we can talk about is the really sad parts where they have depicted the firefighters and those who were immediately affected. We call it acute radiation syndrome. How many of you who have seen it were overwhelmed by the, just the vision that they portrayed here? It, it was just incredible what the director did. Well, he turned what these people looked like over to his makeup artist. And the makeup artist, I'm sure, did absolutely his best job of, of trying to represent what could have happened. And what you see there are not the things that happened immediately, because radiation doesn't do that to you as quickly as it's depicted in the movie or the, the series. But it can do very detrimental things. And what I want you to take away from the acute side of this, the, the prompt side, is that when you see something, very likely it didn't happen that way, but it may have happened to somebody, some part of that, that vision that you see. The second thing that we can talk about is what happened to the people who were adjacent to the event, not the ones who were responding, but the people who were adjacent to it. And one of the major impacts that is well documented is the impact of iodine 131 release from the reactor as it now remember that when it exploded it was a steam explosion it wasn't percolating it wasn't going continuously running it was done and the only thing that was coming out was the fission products well this type of reactor runs for a very long time without refueling and so the fission product inventory into it in it was significant and with that inventory, it continued to release over a period of time where they say it ended at 10 days, but indications are it may have been up to two full weeks. 
before it really stopped moving out of the, the region. Now, what do we have to do with that? Well, the people that were adjacent to the facility, they didn't get the direct radiation. They weren't the ones like the firefighters who either received beta burns to them or direct radiation. They were the ones that received the doses to their thyroid. And that's really where the highest incidences have been identified, specifically because they looked for it in children that were exposed to the plume and they were exposed to iodine. Every session that we've done, the question keeps coming back to why was iodine such an impact of these people? Well, one of the first things that you have to go back and look at is northern Ukraine has traditionally, and they tried to fix it, the Russians tried to fix it for a period of time uh, and then gave up on it, is that it, they are moderately iodine deficient because of their food sources, sources primarily come from the forest and from wild game and the food that they grow there, their iodine intake is very low. When your iodine intake is low, your thyroid enlarges and it becomes starved. And so any time that it has an opportunity to get it, such as we have iodized salt that we use to, to do that, well, it was a perfect storm for them. They had a su supply that was coming out as a vapor and it was iodine-131. Iodine-131 has a half-life of about eight days. It has a biological half-life, which means how long does it stay in me once it's in me? Of about eight days. And as a consequence to that, these thyroids that were starved were impacted because they took every bit of iodine that that body could inhale or ingest, and it went right straight to the thyroid. Now, does that mean cancer? Anybody think that Radioactive material in your thyroid means cancer. There is a probability of cancer. There is a probability that nothing could happen. There is a probability of developing benign nodes on it. All of these were tracked specifically for children between the ages of uh, zero and six and for those that were in utero while um, while the event was occurring. One thing, you, another thing you women need to understand is that when you're pregnant, your thyroid goes deficient. So when your thyroid is already deficient because it's dumping that thyroid, uh, thyroxin into the, the fetus, depending on what stage, the, the thyroid in the fetus doesn't start developing until about 12 weeks. Their thyroids were extra starved. So the women who had the highest doses were the ones who had the highest doses from the, the inhalation, the initial aspect of it. The other side of that is that when you started looking at, when, we, when they started looking at it, um, it was very hard to determine what impact it had locally as far as an increase in incidence of cancer. Because if you want to know if there's an increase, what did you have to know? What it was before. Do you think they had a really good background? On, on what the cancer rate was in the regions. Well, outside of the region immediately adjacent to this, they had good ideas, and that's who they compared it to. And as a, as a result of that, they pulled population centers that may not have the same dietary or, or physiological aspects of it, and there is nominally about a 1% increase or, or a 1% representation of cancers in the region that may have been attributable across the board to um, the release. The last thing that we can talk about, and you can ask any questions on this, because I can make things up and sound like I know. <clears throat> that, that, that's really my job. And uh, one of the things that we can talk about is the impact of the environment. And what did that have, impact did that have on the people that were living there or got evacuated? So any of these topics we can talk about, you get to vote, decide, pick up the, raise your hand, and if I don't know, I'll hand it off to these guys like he's doing. So I get to 
walk you through the sequence of events that led to the explosion you've already heard about. Um, this was an event centered on a test that had been planned for um, before startup of Chernobyl Unit 4. It had actually been conducted on some other units at other stations and at the other Chernobyl units, and it had gone quite swimmingly. But in Unit 4, they were behind schedule when they built it, and the plant manager, who appears in the miniseries, who actually went to jail a bit later, um, lied. He told the authorities in Moscow that the test had been done, and they gave him an award of Lenin uh, for getting his uh, project done um, expeditiously. So by the time of uh, April 1986, they were under the gun to get this test made up and get it done. So there was pressure on the people who were going to do the test. So in brief, the test was to see whether if we lost off-site power at this station and the unit shut down precipitously, whether the turbine rundown would be sufficient to power the uh, safety systems while the diesel generators were starting up so that they could take the electrical load and run the safety systems. So the test was only 40 seconds long, the interval between the shutdown of the, of the power and startup of the emergency power. Um, I'm going to go through the sequence, and I've identified in this sequence eight opportunities that the people in the control room had to stop, uh, go back, regroup, start over again, where they could have avoided the disaster that was about to occur. Uh, these opportunities were violations of technical specifications, violations of their procedures, violations of good conduct of operations, kinds of things that we do in the Western world, especially in the United States, with all of our nuclear power plants. I'm not going to list them as I go, but pay attention and maybe you'll see them. I'm also going to talk about three people who play key roles in the event. There's the deputy chief engineer, a man by the name of Dyatlov. He's the bad guy in the miniseries. Uh, the uh, chief um, or senior reactor operator in our lingo uh, that was on duty, a man named Akimov. And the reactor operator, a young man named Toptunov. Uh, you saw all three of them in the miniseries. Uh, they all died. Uh, Dyatlov a few years later, uh, Akimov and Toptunov within a few weeks. Okay, so it's midnight, uh, the midnight between April 25th and April 26th. Akimov's crew comes on and they begin the uh, shutdown of the reactor from full power to half power. It's a 3200 megawatt reactor, so they're going to bring it down to 1600 megawatts. It's going to take them some hours to do that because it's a slow moving reactor. It does, does not change power quickly. The new crew comes on at um, 8 o'clock the following morning. There are going to be three crews involved here over a four crew period. So the new crew comes on at 8 o'clock in the morning and they were trained, ready to do the test beginning about 2 o'clock that afternoon. At 2 o'clock, the station gets a call from the load dispatcher, somewhere remote from their location, and he says, I need you to hold at half power. The grid needs the electricity. Stay at 1,600 megawatts. Well, they'd already entered into the test procedure and done things like disable safety systems, like the emergency core cooling system. That was a temporary measure, not designed to last very long at any nuclear power plant, if any nuclear power plant. So time goes on, and that crew leaves. They're on from 8 to 4. And a new crew comes on, and they're still holding at 1,600 megawatts. Finally, at 11 o'clock that night, um, April 25th, the um, load dispatcher comes, comes back and says, let's see, did I say 11 o'clock that night? The load dispatcher comes back and says, okay, now you can go ahead and, and shut down. So they begin to decrease power. 
At midnight, Akimov's crew comes back. Akimov's crew is not trained in the test procedure. And here they are, they're back on at midnight, power's coming down, and they're ready to run the test. In the miniseries, uh, uh, Toptunov actually says, oh, here's a procedure, I hadn't read it. Oh, some of it's lined out. What does it mean that it's lined out? They had to call somebody and ask about the lined out part of the test procedure. And the answer they got back was, oh, follow it anyhow, through the lined out part. So it's confusion. At about a half hour into April 26, 0028, they reached a power of 500 megawatts. Now, the test was supposed to have begun at 700 megawatts, so Toptunov is already having trouble. He and his shift, shift supervisor, Akimov, are having a little trouble controlling power. At 500 megawatts, the automatic control system for the reactor goes from one set of sensors to another set of sensors. It's an automatic transfer. But the reactor operator plays a role in uh, a setting, and Toptunov forgot to do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to tell it to stay at the same power when it switched. He did not, and the power dropped from 500 megawatts to 30 megawatts. Now, the physicists in the room will know what's happening at this point. Xenon poisoning sets into the reactor. It happens to every nuclear power plant everywhere in the world. They become very difficult to control when there's a lot of xenon poisoning, and they go into special procedures for how to handle it from there on. Toptunov has been a reactor operator for two months. He's never done a shutdown. He's never read the procedures. He's a young man. He does not have a college degree. So he doesn't know a lot of the physics. In fact, the Soviets never taught their operators a lot of the physics. So he's confused. He doesn't know what to do. But Dyatlov is the deputy chief engineer and a very domineering personality. He says, proceed, proceed, and uh, raise the power. Akimov says, I won't. I won't raise the power. That's a terrible thing to do. And Dyatlov says, you will or you'll never work again in this industry. It's an existential threat to his career. So they start to lift control rods. They lift 205 of the 211 control rods completely out of the core. At this point, the xenon poisoning, the uranium cool down, it's become a very difficult control situation for the reactor. But they managed to get it back to 200 megawatts. Not 700 to what was supposed to start, but 200. Dyatlov says start to test. So Toptunov pushes the button, he shuts off uh, the stop valves on the turbine generators, he tells the diesel generator to start. The 40-second test is underway. At the end of the 40-second, at 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 40 seconds into April 26th, he tells the reactor to scram. Now he did that either because the test was over, or because the power was rising. Both were going on, and the power should not have been rising. He knew that much. But instead of shutting the reactor down, the power raised dramatically. In the miniseries, you saw the, the um, indicator go rolling up, rolling up, rolling up to 530 megawatts. At that point, there's a huge explosion of thud that they heard in the control room. Post-event examination shed said it went not to 530 megawatts, but to 300,000 to 400,000 megawatts. It was an extreme overpower uh, result that blew the reactor up in two successive explosions uh, separated by about uh, a few seconds. And I'll stop with that. All right, so we did, a, uh, we did this last night at the art museum and so many words appeared that I wasn't prepared for. So whoever wrote oops in birthday, I've got questions for you later because <laughs> I watched those kind of keep going, especially the birthday part. Um, not here, so just questions I have. Um, so we're on, what would you like to know about the cause of the accident? Uh, go ahead and if you want to start voting, you can log on to pollev.com forward slash INLOD and start voting. In the meantime, are there questions so far from the audience? Over here. <laughs> 
Real quick, is this was this an incident or an accident? Because I know the language is very specific with those words. Well, I don't think there's a standard, but I have a preference. This isn't an accident. This isn't a waiting to happen. You'll find out there was um, lying about the design defects, that there were um, malfeasance in the way the test was conducted. This wasn't an accident. This was misbehavior. <laughs> uh, six people went to jail. All right, so based on so far the voting coming in, uh, what flaws in the reactor led to the accident? George, can you take this? Sure. Um, like we sort of indicated, it starts earlier than it seems. And the history of these reactors is the reactor, even the generation before this, was used to make plutonium for the Russian weapons program. And part of the reactor design for those is you want to be really efficient with your neutrons because you're trying to make plutonium, not power. And one of the results of that is you build the reactor out of carbon. Carbon is almost transparent to neutrons. It barely absorbs them, scatters them around. They live for a very long time. You need a very large reactor. Um, this particular reactor was 30 feet across and 20 feet high. That's on the order of six times larger than a U.S. reactor of the same power. So as this history where they needed the carbon into in the reactor to be efficient with the neutrons, well, carbon, graphite, doesn't get heat out of the reactor, so you wouldn't be able to run it, so they water-cooled it. So there's pipes inside and pipes full of fuel, and then water runs through those to cool it. Well, water is great for cooling. Water is good in reactors and particular applications, but the important difference here is that water absorbs a lot more neutrons than graphite would. So compared to graphite, which is the bulk of this reactor, the water acts as a poison, takes neutrons out of the process. So the more water in the core, um, the less power it wants to make. Now when you get up to full temperature and the reactor's operating like it's supposed to, it's pretty stable. It's hot. The uranium is behavior is predictable. Things don't change very fast. And that's where these reactors operated most of the time. But when they went into this experimental um, power maneuver, they ended up someplace else. And that someplace else was full of xenon, as Roger said, which is another poison. And that led to them pulling all the rods out <clears throat> to the point where it was almost uncontrolled by rods. And then they had to get it up from 1% power back up to 200 megawatts, you know. Um, so an increase in power, and they didn't have any rods really to pull anymore. They had six. So one of the things they did is they let the water warm up. And warm water is less dense than cold water, so now you have less absorptions and the power came up. Well, the problem was they let the water get to the point where it was almost boiling. And it's coming in the bottom of the core. It's still a liquid, almost boiling. And I use the analogy, this is right before you throw the spaghetti in. Um, it's that sort of temperature, only a pressure and details. Um, so when they got to um, this event and they tripped the pumps, now the water flows down and the water starts to boil. And boiling vapor, water vapor, is even less dense than hot water. And so now that you're taking poison out of the reactor and that makes the power want to go up. Well, when the power goes up, you get more steam. And more steam means you get more power, more power, more steam, more power, and more steam. And that's what causes this very rapid runaway rise in power. And so positive uh, void and positive vo power coefficient is what the technical terms are. And they created a massive version of this just with their experiment. So the power is going up, and then they trip the reactor. And we have a drawing here where, for efficiency's sake, the control rods went in the channel and they put carbon in the middle of it for efficiency. That makes sense. You want more carbon instead of water. Problem is when they trip the reactor, this rod starts to go down and it starts to push water out of the core. Water's a poison. I start to put my scram my reactor and I'm increasing the power in the reactor. So I'm driving around in the parking lot and I've touched the brakes and suddenly my car is going as fast as it possibly can. Where it's not going to end well. And so on top of their test, they did this, which added more power. And um, at that point, whichever one of the cells, tubes, what collection of tubes were, reached the power where the materials couldn't handle it anymore. As Roger points out, 300,000 megawatts. The material started to disperse. This band made a steam explosion. They show in the um, film that the um, 
burst of plasma coming out the top. There must have been a burst in the bottom. This broke the reactor. Now suddenly you've broken your pressure vessel and the pressure is going out into the atmosphere. Really, really hot water under pressure when you take the pressure away also turns to steam, which also removes poison from the core. So you get the first event that you tripped because of the other factors, and now you've broken the entire core. Entire core melts down, the power goes to 300,000, and that's when the thing disassembles and throws itself into the parking lot, causes fires, kills people. Um, it's a ferocious event, and it was caused by this sort of operating the reactor where the runaway reaction would happen. And they set themselves up there. Um, I think Roger can comment that the um, Russians never thought you would operate down there. Why would you? You don't need to. One, two, 20 percent power at a very hot water. So they were just taking it for granted you wouldn't do this. So it was an accident waiting to happen. And uh, I think when they decided to go from the 1 percent power to the 20 percent power, that's when they sealed their fate. So the next question, was the accident's cause portrayed accurately in the miniseries? Roger, do you want to take this one? Yes, they got, they, they got the um, operator error kind of factors right. They got the event sequence right. And they uh, got the design flaw right. Um, in the podcast, uh, the... Uh, writer director talks about the research he did and uh, the knowledge of all the th things that went wrong the operator type errors and the design type errors trickled out over a number of years so um, he had to do a lot of research to figure out what went on and it isn't until the fifth episode in a very dramatic way uh, he sets up an explanation to a jury which is actually a fabrication. Uh, the explanation never occurred that way, but he, he did it for dramatic effect. He sets up the explanation, and then he flashes back to the control room. So he explains A, and then he shows A in the control room. Then he explains B, and then he shows B in the control room. It's very dramatic effect and, and, and accurately done. All right, any questions so far? To tag on to that last question, so was it the portrayal of the um, what the radiation caused that they got inaccurate, or like if the if the accident itself is accurate, what is not accurate? Yeah. I'd say there's two answers just based on my experience with the panel. I think there's the radiation piece, which we can have Brad talk about and then other elements which we can have Roger you want to talk the radiation piece <clears throat> one of the things that comes up most often if for those of you that have seen it is that a firefighter walks up picks up a block of graphite that had been ejected from the core and of course any of you know that when you graphite heats up very very hot but when you take the heat source away it cools down very rapidly so when he picks up the, the piece of graphite, he looks at it and he sees sparkles. So clearly it wasn't a thermal impact to his hand that's portrayed the next scene. The <clears throat> thing that comes with the next scene is that you see that same firefighter sitting on the ground pulling his glove off and his hand is decaying. So clearly that didn't happen that quickly. One of the things when you put hard gammas, gamma radiation, into flesh is that um, it heats up and it causes damage. But it takes a very long time to, for that to, I guess, deflesh itself out. What they showed um, by comparison the makeup artist went online clearly and looked for damage by radiation to your extremities. And if you Google that and you pull up a, a picture, you can pull up a picture of a radiographer who straightened out a, a radiography uh, guide tube and then retracted the source through his hand and back into the camera. I use it in my radiography training for my radiographers. And 
I, I paused it and I looked at it and I went, I've seen this picture before and it comes up exactly. He used a picture of something that was demonstrated that took two full years for that individual to have that much damage to his hand. It's not that acute. So could it have damaged his hand? Absolutely. But it didn't get damaged by five minutes later after he pulled his glove off. You know, one of the things that's associate, I'm going to repeat his question because she didn't get up here quick enough. <laughs> he said, would you feel it? Well, I can tell you that there are people and primarily um, some of the things I do is I counsel employees who have received medical therapy and they say that they can feel the radiation. They say that they'll get a metallic taste in their mouth. And I'm guessing probably the metallic taste came from the iodine that they were inhaling at the time, but interviews with the people that were there said that when they were exposed to radiation, they could taste it. Would you feel it promptly? Absolutely not. You know, it's, it's a thermal heating that may occur quickly. You, will, you would feel a contact burn if it was that hot, but it wouldn't be something he'd go ah, and drop it. Right. You gotta wait for the. Oh, sorry, I wanna follow up with the second part of his question really quick, Brad. He asked about, because we talked about the radiation, what, what it got wrong, what it got right. We talked about the radiation, but there's el other elements that you've brought up in previous panels that also yeah. were I, misportrayed. I, I think your question was, uh, given that the event sequence was done right and the physics was done right, was everything done right? And the answer is no, there were dramatizations that were, were um, not factual. Let me list a couple. Um, one was um, the helicopter crash. You remember that when the helicopters first started flying over the black smoke coming uh, from the reactor core, the first one through crashed. And the implication being that there was damage, radiation damage to either the helicopter or the crew and they died. Well, there was a helicopter crash, but not for six months. It occurred, you know, I think, in October of 1986, uh, not earlier. And it occurred when a helicopter ran into a crane, a um, cable hanging from a crane. Four people died. It was tragic. But it wasn't part of the accident recovery. Uh, another brief example, the uh, plasma jet that uh, George described associated with the first explosion. It went uh, like, uh, I don't know, 3,000 feet into the air. Uh, I'm sorry, 3,000 meters. Um, there was a blue line associated with that because it ionized the water in the air adjacent to the plasma jet. But that blue line was over, if not fractions of a second, in a few seconds. When the miniseries, they had the blue line coming out of black smoke for four days. Uh, that, that wasn't right. They also had black smoke for four days, and that wasn't right. The black smoke was associated with the tar on the roof and other combustibles inside the plant. It went away at about day one. The smoke that followed was either steam from water that was still being put into the reactor or from um, uh, a very hot uh, 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 flaming of the material still in the core. So there are other examples like that. Maybe they'll come up. So just a, a, I have a quick one and a long one. Okay. The, you see people with radiation burns and like they send the one guy out to go look straight into the burning reactor and he, he comes back with big radiation burns on his face. Is that real? One of the things that can be depicted very easily visually is I have radiation exposure so my skin turns red. It would have, by looking down into the core, he would have been exposed to direct radiation that would have reddened his skin very rapidly. Could it have been as quick as it was? I don't know, but it could have. And when you see a lot of these depictions, it isn't that it was wrong because there wasn't anybody to say it was 
you know. So, yes, it could have happened, but I don't think it did that quickly. Very soon after that. The second effect on that is uh, cataracts. And that would happen at about 15 rad exposure, which probably happened within a couple of seconds. Those that don't just suddenly appear in your eyes and you're dead or you're, you can't see anymore, it takes a little bit of a time for the cataracts to evolve. But those are the two acute uh, prompt effects or deterministic effects. A lot of times people say nuclear reactors can't explode. And that's something that you hear people say when they start talking to people about reactors. Can it explode like a bomb? It can't, you know, a reactor can't explode. But it's very hard when you see the images from Fukushima and you see the images from Chernobyl of explosions to explain that to people. So if you could give a little bit of advice on, on how to talk about the steam explosion, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, and I think probably mine. Um, yeah, the, the events that we're showing here are generated by steam, right? Lots of power was released. Clearly that happened. It was clearly nuclear in nature, but it wasn't an explosion in the sense of a weapon. And that's where this gets a little different. You know, I released a whole lot of energy, but I released it in a uncontrolled chain reaction as opposed to the very, very rapid events in a weapon. Um, the time scales are six orders of magnitude different. Um, uh, weapons uh, do the same thing where it's a runaway chain reaction, but it's uh, intentionally lengthened the amount of uh, energy released. They started out with a much larger pulse. It runs away to a higher degree. In this case, relatively speaking, it's slow. You have to turn the steam into vapor, or you turn the water into vapor, has to just form the vessel, has to blow it out. Um, that's just in a different regime. Um, we had the top. Uh, mention of different nomenclatures and not as standard. You're kind of into that region. The Fukushima accident in particular was caused by um, overheating the core after it had been shut down. There was no chain reaction essentially, but there was still decay heat. And that got so hot that the water that was supposed to be cooling it turned to steam, got so hot that the zirconium and the water started to react together and made hydrogen. And those explosions you see there are hydrogen. So the energy actually comes from you know, a byproduct of the event, but not from the uranium at all. So those are two different differentiators there. Um, on our desert, we actually had the SL1 event, and that's a, the physics are a little bit different because of the uh, lack of the runaway uh, energy sh chain on that one, but the same thing happened. They put a lot of energy into the water. The water turned to steam. There was a really, the components came apart and killed three people doing that in the steam explosion itself. So, a separation of sort of time scales and where the energy is coming from uh, would separate those. Roger has an addition. I would like to emphasize that no reactors in the West, in the United States, have been built with positive void coefficients. Never, ever. And it was learned not to do that at this laboratory. These reactors were all built with positive void coefficients in their design. It's a terrible mistake. All right. So, got a question back here. Okay. So I was wondering, uh, the firefighter crews were they trained at all uh, for uh, like a, an incident like or accident like this? Go ahead. Uh, your question is whether the uh, crew that was um, conducting the test was trained. No, no, no. The firefighters. The firefighters. All the firefighters. Oh, the firefighters. Yeah. Uh, no, they weren't, to my knowledge, they weren't trained to deal with a radiological uh, fire. They, they were trained to deal with industrial fires. Okay. But that is the case in the U.S., I guess. Well, that's a, that's a different question and a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, is, and we do have members of our emergency response organization here, and we are going to tomorrow go out and speak to the firefighters and talk about this. But our radiological control program supports firefighter training. Our radiological control technicians are with the firefighters, such as in the event of this summer uh, range fire that we had. They are with them measuring radioactivity if it was there and assuring that we keep our um, – 
our firefighters or our emergency response personnel safe. But one of the things that we would have, and I've asked a technician and the other, you know, a RADCON technician, um, and that's his thing here. It says 3.6 rank and not good, not bad. And that came up in it because the RADCON supervisor relayed the information and said, it, what did you have? Well, it's 3.6 Rankin, but that was the top of the scale. That really, he never got to finish the rest of that. And that would be simply if you were in our one of our facilities and a RADCON technician had his instrument go off scale, what would be our response? We evacuate. We've got to get back out of the area, figure out what's going on, and return back in. But when someone would ask them, we would say, we don't know what it is. It's too high to read with our instruments. So yes, um, and Larry, you want to We have an expert. He's an expert in this um, side of the. He's our the, guest speaker today. Uh, on our um, emergency response training. I'll just make a comment that all the firefighters at the INL are equipped with personal radiation detectors. So they have a dosimeter that actually tells them what their dose is, that they're getting. The range of that device goes up to 1,000 R per hour and it can measure doses up to 1,000 R. Now, we don't let them go that high. But obviously, if they were getting high doses, they would know about it, and they would quit fighting fire and, and get out of the area. So that's something that the Chernobyl firemen did not have. I think the movie did correctly show that they're out there fighting a fire, and no one said anything to them at any time about radiation. The control room people were talking about radiation, but the firefighters were outside fighting a fire. Uh, that's a good point. The um, author of the miniseries made a point of saying that the operation staff, there were 28 people that died from um, uh, acute radiation syndrome. They died early. Of the 28, six were firemen, 22 were either operators, operational staff, or security. There were two women, the rest were all men. The two women were security um, guards that st st stayed on station next to the plant. The, the author said that the People, the, the 22 minus the two security, so the 20 operating people knew what they were doing to save lives and to try to respond to the event would kill them. They, they knew it on scene and they went ahead and did what they did. So the, those were the real heroes of the event. Yeah, so, so I mean, this heroism is an interesting phenomenon, and when we try to account for, for behavior, we, we don't have good psychological models of heroism, but, but you have to realize that they lived there, their families were there, so obviously there was some, some vested interest in trying to have a, a, a successful outcome. One of the things, we, we kind of brought up evacuation and, and this notion that we, we, we will, uh, once we reach a certain dose, we'll get out of there. And um, you, you see that at the site. You see the buses. They're there, ready to go. Um, we don't focus on that, but, but that's one of our realities. Um, they didn't have an evacuation plan, and it does actually come up in the miniseries. It took them, what, three days? What? Day, and a half. day and a half. Okay, day and a, day and a half. Okay, 36 hours. Um, and uh, before they decided to evacuate. And, 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 and the show, it depicts these these arguments that it's it's almost giving up, you know, uh, this is this is Vladimir Lenin's plant. Chernobyl is, is Lenin. It's, it's named after Lenin. Uh, we're forsaking everything that we stand for if we give up on this. And this, um, well, first of all, we don't typically build housing settlements right beside our plants in the U.S. That's not a common practice. But but this idea that that it would somehow be um, um, that you would you would not want to get out of there. Is, is crazy. They didn't have an evacuation plan. They had to figure that out as they went along. That's that's a big difference. All right. Um, I know we, okay, we have a question. Can I just, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead. Because we've already done G. We have established there's no helicopter crash or it's not because of radiation. So, Roger, I was wondering what you meant by positive void um, coefficients. He's, he's passing it to George. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, that's uh, the idea of this runaway um, population of your neutrons. Positive void means something's added. And in a Western reactor, if you increase the amount of voids, voids are the bubbles or air, air inside the coolant. So you're displacing water and making it lower density. And you can build a reactor so that when it loses density, you put steam into it or air, the power can go down or the power can go up depending on how the water is functioning in the reactor. Because the water is functioning as a poison here, when you displaced it or turned it into steam, um, that added more fissions to the process. You ended up with more neutrons. And because of the connection between power and neutrons, right, I had more power, so I got more steam. Well, I got more steam, so I got more power. And those two processes building on each other you know, it happens very quickly at the speed of nuclear reactions, microsecond sort of range. The power just takes off. Uh, it's sort of limited by how quickly this effect can uh, move through the core uh, thermally. And very, very rapid power rises. Like I said, in 40 seconds, it was already climbing off their scale. Um, so that's what the positive void coefficient is. There's also one in power. So just as the reactor makes more power, it doesn't necessarily have to make steam or voids, it can just get hotter, and that can make the reactor power go up, and it can make the reactor power go down, depending on where you are. And this reactor actually showed different behaviors at different temperatures. Um, so those are all subtleties you have to keep track of. At some points it was okay, some points it wasn't. They sort of set themselves up by picking the worst possible place to be. Um, so yeah, that run, just think of it as the run, uh, creating a situation where you can have your power run away so, from you. George, I'll intervene here because this is a clarifying question and I'm exercising my right as the moderator. Um, so that will happen occasionally. Um, so we talked, I think Roger brought up that, that there is no, there were no, are no reactors here built with a positive void coefficient. Can you explain what that was? Is that part of what the borax test was? Why, did we know that and we didn't build that on purpose? Can you, you can yeah, there, expand a little on that? I mean, there were tests that certainly have that effect early on in the event. What you do is you, um, typically a test reactor, they will get them up to some stable power, and there'll be one special control rod built into the rod, reactor that they'll eject with, uh, say, pneumatics. Very, very rapidly pull a, a blade or a rod out of the core, and so suddenly you've got a reactor that's going just fine, and all at once it's missing a lot of the poison inside the reactor, so the power has the same behavior where it goes up very rapidly. Now, it's not a runaway reaction, but it starts to go up very rapidly. And what happens is it heats up or creates voids, and in our reactors, that tends to lower the power. And so the history, you'd watch it, it'd be nice and stable, it'll jump up maybe 100 times, and then it'll shut itself right back down because of the change in temperature or voids. And that can be a pulse far less than a second. And that's sort of what TREAT does. It has a very rapid pulse and comes down. A lot of university reactors um, that sit deep in a pool have this sort of set up. And uh, I'm comforted somewhat to think that if a bunch of university students can't break these things or be unsafe with them, they're pretty safe. Um, it's called a trigger reactor, and they're capable of pulsing like that. So our reactors are intentionally built with this negative effect, um, negative voids and negative power coefficients, specifically to avoid this problem. And I think that was realized very early in the program. So you can get them to run away, but they, they shut themselves down in the designs we have. I'll give an eyewitness account. <laughs> when I was a young engineer and first started to work for the Atomic Energy Commission from Sandia Labs, one of the things involved in my training was to attend ACRS meetings, Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards. They're the, they're the gray beards of the nuclear industry. Um, and I uh, sat in on debates between vendors, the people that build or supply nuclear power plants, and the ACRS in the late 60s. And they came in with fuel designs that they would say, oh, it'll have a positive void coefficient only for a short period of time, and then the burn up will affect the fuel, and it'll go away, and it'll be safe. And the ACRS would not hear of it. There would be no positive void coefficients in a in American nuclear power plants ever, 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 ever. And that's where it started, and that's where it's been ever since. All right, I'm gonna just address this slide. Um, so I told you there's gonna be spoiler alerts if you haven't watched the, uh, the miniseries. Is the bridge of death depicted in the show real? And I think Roger or 
Brad can answer this and if you could explain what we mean by bridge of death. In the, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in the show itself, they have a group of people and quite a few of them stand out on a railroad bridge and look at the, the fire glowing. Now, those of you who are parents have to realize that this was at two, two something in the morning. So, Brad, this is like New Year's Eve or something. Everybody's out there watching the plant explode, right? Yeah, right. right. I, I, I don't. The thing is, is that what they were trying to depict was the people of Pripyat being exposed to fallout. And how do you do that in a dramatic fashion? Well, you have big old cornflakes of uh, fallout material fall on their head while they're watching it burn and having their children play in the dust. And of course, watching the sparkles come from the sky because everybody knows that radiation sparkles, right? <laughs> With the unicorns. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a dramatic effect, but in listening to the podcast, the writer, Mazin, really thought that happened. In fact, in the trailing uh, things at the end of episode five, the bridge of death, they say a lot of those people died. Well, that there are no known cancer deaths from the people of Pripyat. They, they've been followed, and there's nothing been made of exceptional deaths of the people of Pripyat. And as far as we know, there was no bridge of death. But, but, uh, but Mazin thought there was, so um, I don't know. <laughs> but we can uh, assure everybody there were no unicorns there. <laughs> so we're going to go to the next slide and while we answer questions. So back, there was a question back here. Are we just... Uh, that's just a follow-up question uh, to the um, topic heroism. So uh, did any of the actions that the firefighters or the operating personnel uh, did, uh, did that mitigate the post-accident effects to the environment at all or was, were that just wasted lives? I, I, a quick answer is uh, Unit 3 would have burned if they hadn't gone up to the roof and put the fire out. They put the fire out in a few hours, um, five hours is in my memory. But So yes, they, they helped stem the reactor, or the accident, the event. Excuse me, uh, just for curiosity, how, how do they uh, estimate the maximum power uh, of the accident, uh, the maximum power released? You, you know, if you go on the web and you look, uh, look up that, it was actually a calculation done here, um, I think in support of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, but there are several, and if you just Google them, you'll find them. So, admittedly, I haven't watched it yet, but um, I've heard a lot of rumors throughout my life that you keep talking about the positive void coefficient and how we don't have that in the West. I've also heard that the Western world went over to the USSR and, quote, fixed those reactors. Is that any truth to that? Well, there's still 10 of them operating, and I guess, Roger, they're going to operate through 2020, except for maybe one in the, 2030, in the 2030s early. And uh, I don't know that the West fixed them. The Russians knew of this problem well before Chernobyl, at least pockets of Russians, and Roger knows the details. Um, but there were changes that they made. They made the changes to the control rods so you didn't displace water. They made changes in detail to the fuel assemblies so that they had less water and more poison in them. And so they were able to convert these reactors so that they're more stable and more like Western reactors. Um, they still don't have containment. I don't know that if you went out of your way to find one of these spots, you couldn't still find one. Um, but they're much better than they were. Um, in the mid-1990s, the, the Department of Energy asked um, Larry Eberondo and I, who ran a company called Scientech. Larry used to be associate manager here um, back in the EG&G days. Um, to go to Ukraine and establish a joint venture company using Ukrainian people there and 
engineers from the United States to do risk assessments of all of the reactors in, the, in Ukraine. This was not for the Soviets generally, but just for Ukraine. So that the U.S. could spend money, DOE could spend money, taxpayer money, to make safety improvements in the Ukrainian reactors, both their PWRs and their RBMKs. It was quite successful. It led ultimately to Scientech overseeing the construction of the new sarcophagus that was put in uh, on top of uh, Chernobyl Unit 4 last year or the year before. Um, so yes, the United States did make safety improvements in the sense of helping them prioritize where to spend the money. They'd have bought a pump here, a valve there, without doing risk assessment. Uh, the U.S. taught them how to do risk assessment, and then they spent the money more wisely. And I also think, Delisa, that that's a kind of a complex question when you watch the miniseries, which I hope people do after this, um, about uh, Russia's relationship with the West and what they wanted the West to know and led to somewhat of the timeline of when people were actually found out about Chernobyl and how they found out about Chernobyl. And maybe Roger can address that a little bit. So. Well, Gorbachev is um, the premier. and. Uh, He's liberalizing the Soviet Union at the time of the event. But there's still this uh, competition for supremacy or um, respect in the world. And Chernobyl was an embarrassment. Uh, it comes out in the miniseries, and it's a fact that they, they felt Three Mile Island could never happen there, that there wasn't any lessons to learn from Three Mile Island. So what we did with human factors and with um, conduct of operations after Three Mile Island, it didn't soak in over there. So they covered up what had gone on in the immediate days and weeks, but then they finally disclosed what they thought had happened to an assembly of the International Atomic Energy Agency in August of 1986. Turns out that they never disclosed the uh, design defect at uh, that assembly of hundreds, if not several thousand experts from around the world. Uh, Legasov is portrayed as the hero scientist in the miniseries. It turns out Legasov was part of the lie and part of the cover-up. That may have been one of the uh, reasons he killed himself on the second anniversary of, of the event. Um, but slowly over time, actually led by a, an engineer from Ukraine, uh, the design defect became known to the international community in 1990-1991 time frame. Uh, so it took a long time for the Soviets to own up to the facts that they had covered up the design defects, they hadn't deal, dealt with it, that they ignored Three Mile Island, they shouldn't have ignored Three Mile Island. Um, I guess I'll stop there. All right, well, we're waiting to get the question. Um, what is the state of the Chernobyl site today? This is where I get to intervene my favorite fact so far, which Roger has grown to love when I repeat this. Um, so the exclusion zone around uh, Chernobyl, there was a story that came out recently um, that there's a company who is making vodka, that is making vodka made from potatoes grown in the exclusion zone, and it's called Atomic Vodka with a K. So I just like to bring that up because you know, it speaks to the state of the Chernobyl site. So. So, so Brad had asked me to talk about the psychosocial effects okay. of this. And, and, and the only thing I'll mention is that, I mean, there is the exclusion zone. People are not officially allowed back in. It's open for tourism. We should all go. Um, but, but, but one of the things, um, going back to the point that Brad made earlier, is the relative um, poverty of this area up, up until that time. And they had built this city. This was kind of a model city. And it's actually about the same size as Idaho Falls. So imagine if you all had to move out of Idaho Falls, knock on wood, this never happens. Um, and this whole region was rendered desolate. You can't do what the primary industry is, which is uh, um, uh, nuclear energy and uh, farming, right? And so what you've done is you've essentially devastated this part of the economy. And that contributed to um, uh, this ongoing state of Ukraine not being a, a, a resilient economy um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
So it's it's there are other parts of this certainly, but that's there. Th this whole community had to evacuate. They built another community, um, but uh, think of think just take a moment and think about what that would be like for you. And if we couldn't sell our potatoes, not even for vodka. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Courtney, here's yep. the question. So, how long before they actually turn off the other three reactors at the Chernobyl? Uh, they turned off Unit 3 within a couple days. Um, the um, unit manager violated a direct order to keep it at power and went ahead and shut it down. It was down for a couple years and then restarted. They shut Unit 1 down in 1991, they shut Unit 2 down in 1996, and they shut Unit 3 down in 2000. Hence the reason for building another city. You needed people to operate it. I think from, we heard a guy yesterday, you weren't with us, we had a, a man from, used to be at the lab and now runs his own business who trains um, emergency responders on radiation stuff. He goes over there frequently, been over there, what did he say, a couple weeks ago. Yep. And um, oh, I lost the train of my thought. He was talking about how many tourists he there. was talked about how many tourists were there. He, he, he said something else that I've just lost. I'm sorry. No, he talked um, pretty extensively about how he liked uh, Chernobyl better before all the tourists decided that it was a destination. Indeed. So. How many of you would go? Just out of curiosity. Okay. How many have been? How many You heard it here, next year company picnic, right? Can we quote you on that? <laughs> Maybe that's our five year anniversary. You've been here five years, you get to make a trip. Uh, oh, all right, question? Wait. Oh, we got a microphone coming. It, it's more of a statement. I've seen several shows on TV where uh, scientists and wildlife experts have gone back into Chernobyl and it seems like all the wildlife around there is thriving according to them. That's true. Absolutely. Um, anytime you evacuate the people and turn it back to nature, things go back to the way it was before we had an impact on that. Um, the, the region itself has soil activity that's pretty significant still. When you start looking at the cleanup efforts they've done, and you can think of it as like a, an oil stain or the Exxon Valdez, when that hit the shoreline, the people that had the shoreline didn't want it on the shoreline, so they cleaned it up and they moved it down to Oregon. And there's really funny um, depictions of the massive mounds of waste that were generated by cleaning up the Exxon Valdez spill, but now it's down there. So a lot of what has happened with the cleanup efforts is they've moved it from here to there. There's really one removal process with radioactive material, and what's that? Decay. It decays. We can keep it away from us, we can bury it, we can set it over there and not look at it and hope that it doesn't affect us. But for the most part, when nature came back, it's a visual representation of the fact that radiation is detrimental, but it's not lethal. It doesn't cause you to grow multiple heads or to have all kinds of different, but long term there are impacts to radiation exposure and we're getting a very good example with that uh, reserve that they've got, that 30 kilometer reserve. It's the size of Delaware actually, now in the two countries. Um, there is controversy in this area. There's a recent book by a um, professor from MIT. Uh, she's not a radiation specialist, but she spoke um, Russian and she spent a lot of time doing uh, interviews and uh, studies of people in Belarus and um, Ukraine that are either in the evacuation zone and, and don't stay out or near the evacuation zone where radiation levels are also elevated. And she's challenging the linear non-threshold um, hypothesis on dose effects, saying that there are people uh, getting more than average exposures, 
and experiencing more than expected health effects. So I don't know that she's right. I just know that there's controversy and there's continued study. The World Health Organization and the United Nations uh, Scientific Committee on uh, Atomic Radiation are continuing to follow it. The United States and other countries funded, especially the Western Europeans, because of the concern with the lingering levels of radioactivity. But Brad's taught me the, the most important ones are cesium and trontium, and their half-lives are on the order of 30 years, so we're halfway down already, and it'll get better as time goes on. All right, so we voted by far uh, A. How long did the government take to tell citizens they were in danger? Ron, is this something you feel good? <laughs> well, we had the evacuation as we established at 36 hours, but the actual, um, the, them admitting anything was much longer, right? Well, the admission took years, but the evacuation <laughs> uh, occurred at 36 hours. There's some interesting facts around that. Um, early reports, early histories of the event said that when the buses got there, they had to bring the buses from Kiev. Remember this is Soviet Union. Not everybody has a car. Um, especially in those days. So they had to bring buses to evacuate roughly 50,000 people. But when they got there at 36 hours and started to load the buses, they found there were only 21,000 people left in Pripyat. So the idea that the government intentionally delayed and harmed people is, is not completely accurate. There's also the effect of the operators of the four units. Now that's hundreds of people are going into those units in and out for, for that 36 hour period. And they had distributed potassium iodide in advance throughout the city of Pripyat. Those men are, and some women are calling home and telling their families, shut the windows, take your KI, there's something going on here. And that, that's been documented by interviews with people of, of the survivors. So uh, the idea that the government um, screwed up in some way and harmed the people is, in my judgment, not right. Remember Three Mile Island occurred on a Wednesday and the evacuation of uh, children and pregnant women didn't begin until Saturday. So we're very obsessed, I feel, with Chernobyl. It's been before the miniseries, people talked about Chernobyl and why are we so interested in this more than Three Mile Island? Um, I don't know who we are, but um, it, it, the effects were much more disastrous. And we didn't have to um, declare any area uninhabitable in the United States because of Three Mile Island. There were no deaths attributable to Three Mile Island. The long-term health effects have been estimated to be nil. Um, it's just a much bigger event. And the explosive nature of what happened, this idea that nuclear power plants can't blow up like a bomb. Well, it blew up. It wasn't like an atomic bomb, but it was pretty spectacular. So I think those are some of the reasons that psychologically it lingers in the public interest. Um, Ron might also speak to the psychosocial part of this because I think if you watch the miniseries, um, the part about this not having a questioning attitude and people not being allowed to even ask a question about, you know, in, in fear of offending the ruling party. And at the end, it's talks that Gorbachev attributes Chernobyl with the beginning of the end of the Russian state. So, um, yeah, I don't know where to elaborate on that, but uh, the, um, I, I mean, I think a, a more interesting counterpart would be Fukushima, where we did have release. I mean, that's when we, when we talk about Three Mile Island, it was contained. Right, that's that's been our claim to, to fame on that event, and so we didn't have to evacuate large areas or not permanently. Um, as we're looking at at this event, I think one of the interesting things that I noted at the time was how how much um, anger there was across Europe. Um, so it was actually detected in Sweden, and then they're picking up they're picking up. 
um, signs in, in Germany, and that was really kind of forcing the then Soviet Union to admit what was going on. Um, I was actually studying in Germany as, as a high schooler in an exchange at the time, um, a year later, and I, I, I never understood why they were kept advertising that the bread had iodine in it. Um, we don't care about iodine in our bread in the U.S., but it, it's all, it all goes back to that. Um, look at how many uh, nuclear programs in, across Europe have shut down out of, out of fear. Well, they've been exposed. I mean, they've seen the consequences. We haven't had that type of event in the U.S., and I uh, obviously hope we never will. But um, it's changed the psyche in, in Europe. We have, I think, a German there? Or? No, Austrian. Austrian, okay, sorry. And so, actually, uh, I can share a personal story. I was born on May 17th, 1986. <laughs> So just a couple of weeks after Chernobyl. Happy birthday. Thank you the very mystery much. Saw. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, I have two sisters uh, who were already born at that time. And so there was total panic uh, in Austria uh, because, uh, because the Soviets just didn't tell anybody that uh, there was an accident. And so uh, Chernobyl um, was a story that was told all the time in school as kind of like this prototype accident, uh, um, uh, nuclear accident. So yeah, uh, my mom told me uh, that basically she didn't let the kids out of the house for days. Uh, and also there were certain uh, 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 fruits or I think vegetables, uh, uh, my, my, my sisters and then finally me uh, uh, were not allowed to eat. I think mushrooms or uh, stuff like that. So yeah, it uh, directly affected uh, the population in the in Western Europe as well. And I think that also contributed to uh, the skepsis uh, towards nuclear energy in uh, Europe. That accident, because a lot of people remembered those times. There was an estimate in Health Physics Journal in the 90s, I believe, that there had been 100,000 abortions in Western uh, Europe of women who felt that they had uh, the chance of malformed children if they didn't abort their babies. So that's a health effect that dwarfs the actual health effects of, uh, of the accident. Uh, during the emergency pro procedure, uh, uh, if the accident happens, um, you should f evacuate promptly or take shelter in inside, indoor. Yeah, I mean, if things like Fukushima or uh, Chernobyl happens close to your residence area, and which action do you need to do? Yes, that's what we think today. We changed our mind about those things at Three Mile Island. We made mistakes. We changed policy in America. Fukushima, the government did a wonderful job of evacuation in Fukushima. If you go back and see when the orders came, they did it in anticipation of release, not after release. And Chernobyl, they didn't have a chance to do it before the release. The release was there. It was instantaneous. What they worried about was panic and no way to get the people out. Now, how the 29,000 people got out before the 21,000 people were finally put in buses 36 hours later, I don't know for sure. The way they portray it in the miniseries is that uh, Cherbina, the minister that came out with Legasov to kind of control the situation and start the recovery effort, he was afraid of panic. So uh, the people met. On the evening of the 26th, for Sherbina and made representations to him about evacuation and against evacuation. And they were two the traditional. One was uh, do it when you're, uh, uh, um, you reach the threshold dose, and the other was don't, don't do it in advance of reaching the threshold dose. Those were the two arguments. And uh, he went to bed and said he'd make his mind up in the morning. In the meantime, he told the buses to move from Kiev and be there as fast as they could get there. So I think they got them out roughly as quickly as they could get them out, those that didn't already leave. And there were um, 
I don't say orders, but there were indications from the plant back to the people in Pripyat to close their windows. So that's shelter in place. Uh, I, I've heard that uh, in Fukushima that uh, there are some area that uh, they, they don't need, need to take evacuation uh, really yeah I, I've heard some 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 argument that, that saying that uh, they, they don't need to evacuate some uh, such huge region is that true or it is still under debate I'm not aware of that argument. I do know that the area that was finally evacuated, they've been letting people back in gradually as they, as they prove that they meet the national criteria for uh, re-entry. So some areas were more contaminated than others, logically. Um, um, I think they did a great job, um, but I I wasn't told to leave my property, so I'm sure there's sentiment among people that were told to leave their property that they'd like to go back. Come to the fact or fiction section on Fukushima that I'm sure we're planning. So I just want to point out that whoever put the potato emoji up, you're my hero. Um, and also, uh, you know, the panel will be here for a little bit if you want to come ask questions. A couple last minute uh, points. Um, you do have feedback forms, as I said. Um, you know, we are learning as we're going. We're getting better, we hope. Um, so number one, please fill out your feedback form. It just takes a minute. It really does help us. And one of the questions is, if you want to see more of this type of panel discussion on different topics, what would those be? Also, we've tried to curate some content on INL.gov's trending topics under Chernobyl. Um, so people who are interested can go read articles that the panel has helped us pick that we view as you know, accurate and portrayals and can give good information about the miniseries and what happened. And finally, there are a whole lot of cookies left and we have been eating like so many cookies and bagels because of these, uh, we've had food at every one of these. And so please, you're all on a cookie quota. Cookies before you go. And let's thank the panel for their time. Thank you.